All right, so we're going to start on time, I guess. Um, and feel free to, um, because this is very long talk, like two hours, I'm not going to do this alone. So you're going to crowdsource the talk. Um, please uh, scan the QR code here, or just um, if you are on a laptop or something, uh, go to slido.com and enter without a hash sign on 10101, which is very easy to remember. Um, and so either by scanning the QR code or going to slido.com uh, 10101, uh, you get into this anonymous chat room. Uh, feel free just to start asking me questions like now. Uh, and and um, like each other's questions. So the uh, idea is that the more people like the question, the higher the question will go uh, on the list. And so I'll know that uh, how many people here are interested in one particular aspect of the talk so that I can just uh, dive into it. And of course, um, feel free to raise your hand at any given time and ask me questions. So this two hours will be entirely interactive. Um, and if I can't get to all your questions by the end of two hours, um, apologize in advance, uh, but uh, I think uh, we'll try to um, just talk about all the different aspects of radical exchange based on what people are interested in. Um, and so um, I'll just start then, and I'll just flip back to the Slido questions uh, every couple of slides. So my name is Audrey Tang, uh, and my day job is Taiwan's Digital Minister, but I'm on vacation right now because it's a um, national vacation day, it's Taiwan's National Day. Uh, and so I'm wearing another hat uh, as a board member to um, Radical Exchange, which is a foundation, uh, as well as a, a movement. And so Radical Exchange, uh, in, in a nutshell, is the idea to use mechanisms design to find ways for people to collaborate across difference. Uh, sounds simple, right? Uh, in any case, um, the Radical Exchange Foundation uh, is a uh, registry in New York um, and is responsible for uh, just advocating the various ideas that starts from the book, uh, Radical Markets, but now has grown into all sorts of different things. And we uh, send speakers to speak at academic and business conferences and DEFCON, obviously. Um, and also, if you see this logo RXC, uh, we're looking for designers that can do better logo. But that's our logo uh, for the time being. Um, and so this is our like standard slide set. But I'll just skip that. It, it, if you want, you can uh, look it up online. And I'll just talk some of my personal anecdotes and stories about how I encountered this RXC idea and how I'm deploying in my day job as well as um, you know, my non-day job uh, activities. So in my day job, which is, um, you know, Minister of the Cabinet, uh, we're often faced with this, um, when emerging technologies come, um, there's various different organizations with different um, agenda. And so whenever there's a new um, technology, maybe there will be people who care more about um, the economic aspect, the development of the uh, economy, but there will be also people who care more about the social justice uh, or sustainability of the environment and so on. Um, and the uh, um, Korea Public Service, which is this part, um, absorb all the tension uh, of all those different organizers and try not to break the social trust, uh, but they remain largely anonymous and uh, had to talk um, in a kind of one-to-one -one fashion to all those different uh, organizers. But now because of there's a new technology, well not really new, but newish technology called the hashtag, uh, and that becomes kind of the, the nightmare of public service in liberal democracies everywhere, because with the <laughs> hashtag, you know, hashtag me too, hashtag climate strike, uh, hashtag anything, DEFCON 5, uh, you can <laughs> just organize random people out of the internet and try to push for a particular agenda with no obvious person leading it. And so this traditional way of institution, which uh, you just meet with one representative of one particular um, movement and try to strike a balance, no longer works because there may be emergent um, ideas and emergent organizations uh, everywhere. And so the idea of institution uh, standing in the progress of uh, innovation become kind of very trendy. And so, which is why we're now rethinking of how to uh, use institutions to amplify technologies and use technologies also to amplify the efficiency of institutions. Instead of trying to work kind of in a zero-sum game, uh, we're designing a new set of institutions. Uh, in the works of uh, Buckminster Fuller, um, the idea when you're looking at an old broken institution is not to fight it, it's not to try to fix it, and so on. It's instead just to try to find something new that makes the old one obsolete and 
that's exactly what I'm doing uh, in my day job. And so uh, it's very much within the spirit of radical exchange to uh, just find institutions that reinforce the institution with new technologies that makes people behave in a more pro-social manner. So I'll just use one example. Um, there's this institution, which is uh, my working condition called Radical Transparency. When I became the digital minister three years ago, uh, I made a deal with the premier saying that all the meetings, even internal meetings, that I'm a chair uh, must be published entirely online as a transcript uh, two weeks after the fact. And all the um, lobbyists, all the media, everybody who uh, just meet me uh, must also agree to this um, radical transparency idea. And so if you're interested, the protocol is written in visit.pds.tw, which spells out exactly how the um, transcript is to be um, published. But um, it's then coupled with the institution of physical space called the Social Innovation Lab in Taiwan. And this is where everybody can meet me uh, on Wednesdays. There's a uh, office hour, so it could be booked online or you can just walk in. And every Wednesday from 10 a.m. to 10 p.m., uh, you can just book 40 minutes of my time and talk about anything. Uh, but the only condition, as I said, is that it will be uh, uploaded to this website called Say It. So if you Google for Say It, you will easily find that after I become the digital minister, I've talked with you know 4,000 people um, uh, over 1,000 occasions and on 200,000 speeches. And so before, uh, when I talk uh, with lobbyists and media, without this radical transparency uh, protocol, um, then people are inclined to talk about things that suit their private interest. Uh, people are inclined to lobby uh, in their favor, uh, often at the detriment of the entire uh, society or environmental benefit of the public benefit. But because I made that into my working condition that everybody must agree to a radical transparency protocol, if you look at a transcript of people coming to my office hour, actually everybody talk about public benefit. Everybody talk about the global goals. Everybody talks about sustainable development. And the reason is that people know that uh, their ideas will become public, uh, part of the commons. And they must also relinquish copyright for everybody else to pick up on those ideas. And so just this very simple flip in the institutional default of open transparency by default, uh, changes people's behavior, and people are much more inclined to just reveal what their ideas have to do uh, to encourage other people's idea instead of doing a zero-sum game trying to lobby things into their favor. And so this is one of the uh, examples of how institutional technology together um, can change uh, people's relations so that people who work against each other can then be um, moved to, to work together. And so uh, RxC um, is very, very interesting uh, in that uh, we put artists uh, up front. So <laughs> it's a convention of people who have a different imagination of, of life, of society, as well as entrepreneurs, activists, thinkers, and so on. And so um, the idea is just to have this safe space where people can propose all sorts of very weird ideas. And this, uh, for example, in my uh, office hour, there's just random people who um, just put those I don't know, self-driving vehicles. They're uh, vehicles that are robots. And if you hop on one and tell you where you want to go, it will drive you there. Uh, but they're tricycles, and they're very slow. And so they come to me and say, you know, minister, would you like to just ride on one of our tricycles, even though it bumps into walls all of the time? Uh, <laughs> I'm like, what? <laughs> and, and, but then they assured me, they're from MIT Media Lab, they assured me that they're uh, really slow. So if it bumps into walls, nobody gets hurt, which is good, I guess. Uh, but the idea of uh, showing this as a social object in an open space, and welcoming artists and entrepreneurs, is that people can see this but have a very different take. Uh, I remember when we were on this open hackathon where we showed this self-driving vehicles and trying to work out, because it's open source and open hardware, how to fork it uh, to various different uses. There's just a, a uh, elderly couple uh, that uh, went from the nearby uh, flower market, and they just bought some pots of flowers, and they look very artistic. Uh, and uh, so, you know, maybe um, old hippies, um, no, with all due respect. Uh, and then <laughs> Uh, they, they just look into these uh, self-driving vehicles and they're like, you know, what are you doing with those shopping carts? And we, we try to explain that these are not really shopping carts, but they think they l look just like shopping carts in a supermarket. And so they're like, this must be shopping carts and what are you doing with them? And so we have to explain things in terms of shopping carts and say, okay, these shopping carts follow you around if you wanted to. Um, and so they just put some flowers uh, into the shopping cart and ask us right on the spot if we can reprogram the shopping carts so that whenever it's full, uh, it summons another one to form a fleet so that they 
can follow them around in the flower market. And obviously, it's not programmed to do that. It's programmed to be a taxi service, essentially. Uh, but it's open source. So theoretically, there's, there's no um, limitation of um, not doing that, right? So quite a few uh, entrepreneurs um, around the time uh, thought may, it may actually be a good idea to just repurpose them as the way the elderly couple imagined it. Uh, but they would have to make changes. For example, instead of one red cyclop eye, um, they have to make two eyes that can follow each other around so people know where the fleet is forming and where uh, which person they are looking to. And they have also to be un uh, able to understand human emotions and also uh, emit nonverbal uh, communication cues. Um, so it's like co-domestication of robots versus um, humans. But because this is a safe space for all the different people to share their aspirations and their imaginations, um, people are free to just fork it and uh, move it whichever way. And so uh, form a what we call a social norm. And the social norm is toward a open and efficient and more egalitarian society because it's not about people in the MIT media lab dictating what people in Taipei uh, have in relation to this new technologies, but rather people looking at those uh, semi-done parts and figure out what they want from the technology and have the technologists uh, respond to it. And so uh, in governance uh, parlance, this, this is what we call a norm-first design where we just form out the social norms and uh, by having people exposed to new technologies and new ideas. And from the norms, uh, the market uh, decides they want to build a market around it. And then from the market, maybe we get into code, into architecture that ensures the market's policies. And this is, of course, a symbiotic relationship. And finally, after these two figure things out, finally we make a law about it. And this is much better than the usual top-down way where people first make a law about it, often by lawmakers that has no first-hand experience whatsoever uh, with technology, and then constrain the uh, limit of technologies that constrain the markets, that constrains the social norm. So we would argue that this kind of uh, way is much better if we involve artists and entrepreneurs as the first uh, batch of people to experiment with a new idea. And that is why Radio Exchange convenes uh, regularly people from different uh, disciplines and encourage effective partnerships. And so um, our first Taipei meetup uh, was um, in July, I think, uh, and with Vitalik and also Jennifer um, and also somebody from HTC, I think, uh, selling this uh, very secure enclave phone thing. Uh, and so, uh, <laughs> right, so, so no, uh, with all due respect. And so uh, this is the, the place where uh, we first announced our first uh, application of quadratic voting, which you may have heard about in the previous session uh, in the Taiwan's administration in the presidential hackathon. And around the same time, uh, Santiago Siri and friends are also hi, <laughs> uh, working with the Colorado um, budgeting uh, initiative. So uh, we, we probably announced around the, the same the same week, actually. So. <laughs> Uh, okay, maybe. <laughs> by, by a few days. By a few days, right? Um, but, I mean, it's a different branch, right? We're in the administrative branch and they're in the legislative. Uh, and so this is uh, marks the uh, first uh, way that uh, quadratic voting is used empirically uh, as a voting method. And I think it's great that we set a very good norm, very good example, by having the two projects all open source. And also we published anonymous data for people to, to analyze. And so I think that's a pretty good contribution. Um, and so before I jump in and talk about presidential hackathon and application of quadratic voting, I'd like to just remind people who um, joined kind of in the middle that this is an interactive talk and you're highly encouraged to scan this QR code on the upper left corner or go to slido.com and enter 10101 so that you can ask me questions. And please remember to like each other's questions so that I would know that how many people like me to talk about any people's uh, ideas. And so, um, and there's quite a few follow-up questions. I love this. So I'll just answer them before delving into a presidential hackathon. So uh, one anonymous person would like to know, uh, how do I know open by default is causing behavior change rather than selection bias? Well, it's a, it's a great uh, question. So the idea, very simply put, is that I had people sending me long emails that argue for their private benefit and uh, ask for a time for the meeting. But I said, you know, uh, if you're going to meet me, uh, you have to, you know, have the entire transcript published online. And so when they actually do meet me, 
um, many people would start prefacing, you know, um, I understand that we are on the record, so today I'm not going to talk about things that uh, I mentioned during the email. I'm instead talking about a public good uh, application of my idea and, and things like that. <laughs> and so there's so many um, ideas like that around, and uh, even with uh, David Poof, uh, which, uh, who was at the time uh, the public policy person for, for Uber, um, and of course, he asked for a meeting, uh, like one-on-one -on -one, uh, meeting. But uh, I said, you know, everything will be publish published, and so um, and so. This is a, a very telling mark that uh, where he ended the conversation, saying, "I do think there are more details that we can work out. I'll ask the local team to prepare materials and send them over to you." And I'm like, "Sure, just note everything you send my way will be made public." Um, and so, <laughs> right? Um, and and so. I mean, you, you can actually look into each and every word that we said <laughs> during the conversation, starting from the doorbell. <laughs> uh, right? um, and uh, the kind of arguments that he makes, which is about, I don't know, environmental sustainability, um, you know, carbon neutrality and efficiency in ride management and, and things like that. And so I think that the great thing about this is that uh, we're making arguments not just for the sake of convincing each other or about uh, furthering our, our interest, but because be, this is entirely public and we know that people will translate all of this into Mandarin and people can actually quote uh, all of us uh, and not uh, out of context because by definition uh, each one of this, if you click show context, it would just show the conversation in context. So without any risk of getting quoted out of context, we're much uh, more likely to further our arguments in a way that convinced the wider public rather than just the person uh, across the table. So you can just see this behavioral change once people start dawning on them that uh, they're not here to convince me, but rather amplify or uh, channel through me their arguments to reach into what we call a rough consensus, that is to say, people can live with those ideas uh, with the um, entirety of the society. So uh, I think this is not selection bias because it's the same individual. It's just in a different social setting. You gradually starting seeing that they realize it's dawning on them that this is on the record and the entire behavior pattern just start adapting and start changing and, and things like that. So um, yeah, I think it's my first time experience that people do uh, change in their strategies when they understand that they're on this kind of open conversation meeting. Um, so three people would like to know, <laughs> is there a date for the next year radical exchange conference? There is a location. I think the date is still um, being finalized, but we know that it will be in Sao Paulo, um, and we, we don't know the exact date. Or right. So um, just, I don't know, subscribe to Radical Exchange on Twitter, and <laughs> the date will be announced uh, in, in due time. Um, what else? Um, would you consider making your emails uh, transparent as well? So this is obviously not talking about email addresses, right? Because my email address is entirely public. I just look it up on Twitter. <laughs> um, so, so my email transactions, um, entirely transparent. It, it's actually what I did uh, in, the, in the first place when, I, uh, when it was announced that I would become the digital minister. I use a now defunct uh, platform called Wiselike, uh, where people can ask me any questions, but I only answer in public. And if people ask me questions uh, on private email, I just anonymize their identity, but still respond to public. Um, and so this has been a kind of default way of my uh, conversations so far. And because of this, uh, people learned uh, that they don't have to uh, just keep asking me the same questions, because it's now very easy to just go to the, the forum of my office, which is called PEDIS, Public Digital Innovation Space, and just go through the various questions that people have asked me before and have a kind of standardized answers. And it's also very uh, convenient for me because then I don't have to uh, just um, come up with fresh answers every time. <laughs> when people ask me questions um, over private email, I'll just do a uh, full text search uh, on their question. This is like a knowledge base. And then I'll just paste them the URL uh, to the previous person that asked the same question. And they can, of course, ask a deeper question. But the factual question, they don't have to, to repeat twice. And this is not just something that I do um, by myself. Uh, actually, the entirety of the Taiwan cabinet, or the 32 ministries, all learn this kind of, uh, like, uh, if you ask me in private, I'm going to answer in public uh, art. And so I think I wouldn't 
uh, say that all the incoming emails must be made uh, open by default, mostly because unlike the visit protocol, there's no way for people to signify that they already understand the full repercussion that the email to this address will be made public. But I think it's always a good idea if the answers are made public, or at least the answers uh, that doesn't quote the, um, I don't know, if they ask me an email and mention some anecdotal thing about a third party person, and they may not actually give the, the clearance of that person's um, um, data or ideas or information be made public this way. So I usually just anonymize those um, names out, but I still give out a full answer uh, in the public uh, conversation. So I think that address at least parts of this answer. Um, so three people would like to know, does my radical transparency come at a cost? Does it take more time or effort to live your life that way? Are there tools to help us do the same? So there's a great question. Well, two questions, but anyway. So uh, the first thing is that it actually saves a lot of time. As I mentioned, all the different ministries in Taiwan um, have learned this um, art of just publishing. This is e-petition, this is regulatory pre-announcement, and this is the budget. So all the 2,000 or so um, governmental budgets, um, I haven't done a Google Translate, but it doesn't really matter, and people who are Japanese can read the kanji anyway. But in, <laughs> in, in, in any case, <laughs> the idea is that all the different ministers, they have their um, KPIs, their projects, and things like that, and we can very easily see where the budget went, as well as what kind of uh, projects people are most interested in. So this long-term care, this is sanitation, this is uh, social housing, and things like that. So for long-term care, people People can easily say that this is um, something that they care the most about, and this is our quarterly report. So every quarter, they uh, report everything, the KPIs, whatever they have achieved, and things like that. And just last month, actually, uh, we agreed to publish to our, our um, academic partners. Everybody can ask for a full copy of the structured data of all the procurement associated with all government projects, with all those 2,000 uh, long-term projects topics. And so the entire um, details of procurement data is also open government data. And so people can very freely ask questions here. And normally, um, they will ask questions in a way that is private, that is to say uh, they just write to the ministry. But if they answer them one by one, nobody knows that there's already 40 people asking the same questions. But now because they learn to communicate through this participation platform, people can very easily ask questions. And the Ministry of Health and Welfare, for example, would just say, hey, for this quarter, uh, we detected that these are the trending questions and we made these changes because of your input and things like that. And if people uh, keep asking the same questions, just like me, they would just paste the URL to this conversation board so that they make each government project a social object so that people can very easily find it on search engine, but also start asking deeper questions instead of um, wasting people's time answering the same factual questions uh, one at a time. So basically it uh, is a, a lot of work uh, initially, but amortized, I think it saves a lot of work because people would just find out um, the answers to their factual questions and start uh, collaborating and even bring out their creative solutions, which then would further um, save time. Uh, five people have a suggestion. Please turn off the lights so people can see the uh, text here. Um, if there's no five people saying, keep on the light, please, uh, let's just turn off the light. Thank you. <laughs> So, so let's um, maybe get back to the to the presidential hackathon and quadratic voting, which is actually the R, uh, pr premier RxE product. Um, and so the question uh, here is, why is the Taiwan government, uh, in particular, so far leaking in its adoption of cutting edge uh, concept of radical markets? Um, that's a really good question. Um, there's two answers. The first one is that the Taiwan presidential election is actually a relatively recent thing. Our first presidential election is in 1996. And so when the first presidential election happens, uh, there is already World Web. When people start doing democracy and design for democracy, we are informed not only by representative democracy, which we have 
zero years of uh, proud legacy of Republican tradition because there was a dictatorship and martial law right before. Uh, and so, so there's no legacy of representative democracy. And when people started voting directly for, for president, there is already this full uh, wealth of the, the Wild Web, uh, the Internet Engineering Task Force, the Internet way of governance already serving as an example. So instead of like in many uh, older republics where people specialize in internet technologies uh, went to one school and people who specialize in public administration and democracy went to another school. Uh, in Taiwan, this is the same generation. Uh, we're really the first generation that can do democracy. And we, when we're doing democracy design, we're exposed also to wild web for the first time. And so because of that, I think it informed our imagination. And you can more or less see the same dynamic playing out in Estonia because they got their constitution after internet. And so they don't have this proud legacy of you know paper trails uh, to, to take care of. And so uh, they, they can just start inventing democracy using purely electronic means. And so that's my first uh, answer. That explains why people are much more uh, cutting edge in Taiwan because we don't have a uh, legacy system in our democratic system to uh, maintain. And the second thing I think is also because in Taiwan we have broadband as human right. Uh, if you don't have broadband as a human right, it's very easy for the opposition party to say that if you roll out these radical ideas, then people are going to be left out systemically. But in Taiwan, we say um, no matter how far away you are, you may be in the southmost Pacific island of the Marine National Park of Dongsha, maybe the island of Taiping, and you're guaranteed to still have 10 megabits per second. Uh, if you're on the topmost of Taiwan, which is almost 4,000 meters high, the Jade Mountain, Yushan, you're also guaranteed to have 10 megabits per second. Um, and so our uh, indigenous rural remote areas uh, broadband coverage is at 98% now, and the uh, remaining 2% are mostly in very high mountains, and our Minister of Interior actually just said last month that he's very much willing to use helicopters to just build the 4G uh, telecom towers to all the remaining mountains, so our coverage will be at 100%. And so this is very um, devout dedication <laughs> to, <laughs> to broadband as human right. <laughs> right. And, it's not just accessibility, it's also very affordable. So um, unlimited 4G connection anywhere in Taiwan is only 16 US dollars per month, uh, which is very affordable. So you get people anyone really, just primary schoolers becoming YouTubers because there's no additional cost of being a YouTuber. Everybody can participate in this live streaming um, technology and live streaming culture. And so because of we have broadband as human rights, it was a very affordable price as well as the digital opportunity centers for people who cannot afford a new tablet. Uh, they can lend one from the public library that's guaranteed to be uh, manufactured in the previous three years or so. So relatively new. Uh, and we offer that for indigenous nations as well, as well as uh, schools. So because of that, there there is really um, no uh, opposition party uh, that can say, you know, once you roll out this participation platform, it's going to leave people behind because everybody is on the internet. And so uh, our participation platform, which has just shown you the public budgeting and also a petition website, uh, currently has 10 million active users. And considering Taiwan's population is 23 million, uh, that's already almost half of our population that can use the internet. And so I think that's the second um, answer is that we not only start imagining democracy when the World Web is already in place, but also uh, because we have dedicated uh, budget on education and broadband as human rights so that uh, we can just roll these cutting edge technologies without any political pushback. So I think that's the two questions. So um, presidential hackathon is one of our uh, innovations uh, that incorporates quadratic voting in the administrative branch. So um, hackathon, everybody here knows what a hackathon is. <laughs> we don't have to explain that. But normally uh, our hackathons in the open source community are maybe two days or three days. Uh, but the presidential hackathon, because presidential, it's three months. Uh, and <laughs> so it's a very, very long marathon. Um, and so it's kind of a, a um, stretch uh, on the word hackathon. But the idea, very simply put, uh, it's, it's inspired by very similar um, ideas like the German prototype fund. There's ideas like that all over the place. And we just improve on it using quadratic voting and a different uh, prize structure. So anyone around the time of April uh, can start proposing ideas that use data 
and technologies and innovation to make public sector work better. And so one example from one of the five winning teams last year uh, is the water saviors because they save water, you see. So um, this is a person from the Taiwan Water Corporation and they just using those listening devices to listen to the pipes that may or may not be leaking. And so in a uh, pilot area that they chose for uh, presidential hackathon, it used to take two months when the pipe starts leaking the plastic pipes um, and uh, the time that it gets discovered that it's actually leaking. And most of the time, this repairs people just listen to the pipes that are not leaking. And so it's not a very rewarding job and they have trouble you know, recruiting young people, uh, obviously. Uh, and so uh, they went to the presidential hackathon saying, uh, maybe it's a better idea if I can develop a chatbot. And the chatbot would look at uh, the water pressure data, water flow data, environmental data, um, weather data, whatever, and then uh, detect spikes uh, in different water usage patterns and uh, very easily let those repairs people see when they wake up uh, that what are the three most likely leaking points near them so that they can devote their time uh, solving the leaking points which requires creativity instead of listening to places that's not leaking which doesn't require um, creativity. And so uh, we automate those away uh, using AI or as we like to call it assistive intelligence. But um, the public sector people doesn't have the expertise in making such um, technologies and so through the presidential hackathon um, we basically coach them and uh, pair them with the private sector technological experts who just donate a few weekends uh, to contribute. So it may or may not work, but if it doesn't work, there's no harm done. Uh, and we also couple them with uh, people in the social sector, with people who understand how to communicate and how to design chatbots, how to engage with the open source community, the organizers that serve as kind of liaisons uh, to people who have already solved some of that questions before, not uh, necessarily in this domain, but they uh, are, act as connectors. And so uh, we also ask all the different entries uh, to identify their work using the Sustainable Development uh, Goals, the SDGs, and it's a very useful indexing device. Uh, we don't have to explain a lot about the system we're working on, which is say it solves SDG target 6.4, uh, and there's uh, 169 um, targets, and so all in the form of target something does something, and once we say that, everybody across the world knows that oh, we have a contribution to increase water use efficiency and ensure fresh water supplies and so they got a trophy and the people from New Zealand for example then invite them for another three months of co-creation. All of this sounds pretty standard. So what's special about the presidential hackathon? Well it's the trophy. Um, so the trophy looks some, something like this actually uh, but um, with a stunt that is a projector. Okay so the idea simply put is that our president, this is our president by the way, Dr. Tsai Ing-wen, uh, um, see the uh, final competition at her office, the presidential office, uh, and give out five uh, awards to five teams. Uh, that's the team of the year. And so the five teams receive no prize money whatsoever, and but they receive this trophy from the president, which is a projector, as I mentioned. And if you turn it on, it projects the image of the president handing the trophy to the team, so it's very meta. Um, um, so, <laughs> so, and and um, you can choose uh, which part of the the video you want to play, and so on. It's very cutting edge. Um, but for people in the private uh, in the private sector, this this may be just something that that looks good on their portfolio resume. But for people on the public sector, this is a godsend because uh, for people who pilot on a small area like the Jilong area that I explained, most of the time they talk to their director general, and their DG would say there's no budget to scale it out uh, to the entire Taiwan, but then they just turn on the projector and their director general say, oh, there's budget, there's budget for it, we'll make it into our annual budget. Um, and so if their minister says this requires cross-ministerial coordination because um, the Ministry of Economy can't just take care of it alone, we'll have to talk about the Environmental Protection Agency, we'll talk about the Ministry of Interior, it's too much of a hassle, let's just uh, scale down this project. You just turn on the projector and summon the president and the minister will say, oh, tomorrow we'll just schedule a talk with the president another minister. Um, and so <laughs> this works because this is essentially a, a token of uh, presidential promise. Uh, whatever they have prototyped in the previous three months is guaranteed to be included into national policy 
by within the next 12 months. Uh, and so the president's office, my office, everybody's office, do whatever we could. Uh, for many of the teams, we made new uh, agencies, we made new personnel, uh, we uh, changed regulations uh, around telemedicine, for example, uh, and we allocate new national budget uh, for it. So whatever you do, uh, the uh, Taiwan government is committed to make your idea a reality within the next 12 months so you can work on something new instead of trying to find out uh, you know whether you how to scale it out or whether to scale it out so basically scaling to the scale of Taiwan is the reward of the presidential hackathon and so that is a very uh, attractive reward structure and so um, last year all the five teams uh, got their ideas implemented as of this year so we're going a lot of street credibility uh, and so this <laughs> this year there's a record number of teams participating and that creates a problem because it's very difficult Actually, once you have a whole palette of uh, projects solving all those different sustainable development goals, it's actually very difficult to judge which ones to make into top 20 and receive this trisectoral support because each one is solving obviously one important thing in the 17 uh, sustainable goals. But how do you weigh environmental projects versus social projects versus economical projects and the projects uh, everywhere in, in between? And the answer is that we can't. The, the jury, uh, by definition, uh, cannot be um, an expert of all the 169 things. There's nobody on the planet that uh, memorized all the entire SDGs and is an expert on each and every one of them. So we have to crowdsource. And crowdsource is usually on the platform of a uh, voting system online. And we, of course, has this um, platform already, right? Uh, the joint platform, which, as I mentioned, have 10 million um, active users out of 23 million. So that's a start. But how do we make sure that when there's hundreds of teams, um, the voting actually reflects what people feel about the teams and the teams' uh, ideas that people can resonate with? Because in, uh, if we don't design this right, people are just going to be mobilized by their friend who are in the team and go to the website and vote all their votes on that single team without even glancing the other 100 or so projects. And that's what usually happens if you run a uh, voting system like that. And so that's when quadratic voting entered the picture and basically uh, helped create a much more nuanced and balanced uh, top 20 um, team selection. And so QV, um, very simply put, uh, as implemented in the presidential hackathon, is that everybody who log in to the participation platform gets 99 points. And we chose 99 instead of 100 because we don't want people to go vote on a single uh, project. Because if, as you can see, if you really like I don't know, um, if you really like reduce marine pollution um, and you vote for this team, um, you vote for one vote, uh, and that's going to cost you one point. If you vote for two votes, actually, it's going to cost you four points because it's quadratic. Uh, and um, if you want to vote nine votes, then that's um, 81. Right, so by the time that you click in the interface to vote the ninth vote, uh, the system will tell you that you cannot vote the tenth vote because that will require 100 points, but you only have 99. And so you still have, what, 18 left. And because you have 18 left uh, and you don't want to squander this vote, and that's the core insight of RxC, is that people don't want to squander the, the votes, the points that they have. Uh, people instinctively feel that they must find something else to, to vote on. And so maybe you look around and say, oh, you want to uh, train a machine learning model to detect illicit fraud, Panama paper style. Um, that sounds like an interesting project. And then you discover that with your 18 points, you can only vote four votes uh, because that's 16 points and you still have two points left and because people don't want to squander those two points they will look around and find other project which by by the time they uh, vote on the fourth project they will probably find something that is actually much more within their domain knowledge that gate then can uh, judge that it's actually going to create a much more impact and uh, maybe marine pollution is still important but maybe it's not as important as you know um, requiring 81 points. So maybe they will just take a couple of votes away so that uh, they can vote on both of them uh, using seven votes, uh, which is then 49 points each. And that's still 
well within uh, the qu quadratic voting budget. And so this um, whole uh, process of going through the different options, voting this more, uh, taking away some votes and taking some more, uh, all these activities we've published uh, on GitHub uh, in anonymized fashion, so that if people want to analyze how QV impacts people's um, interactions with those projects, feel free to just analyze this. But we are very happy about this as jury because this then helped us to discover the various different projects that we don't have domain knowledge on, but people nevertheless feel strongly about, and a lot of people feel relatively strongly about, and then we go and learn about it, and then we discover it's really actually a pretty good idea. And so uh, this really um, covers a much broader ground than uh, our jury of maybe a dozen people can, and then it informs our uh, next round of selection as well, because then people who have participated are much more willing to contribute their expertise into uh, trying to make this idea a reality, uh, because people feel generally that they've won because it's much more likely uh, compared to the previous uh, arrangement where you just vote everything on one project and just leave the website. Uh, it's much more likely that some of your voted projects did make it to the top 20 or top 10 or top 5. So people feel much more identified and when we have a call to collaborators, people who have voted even just one vote or two votes uh, to a certain project is much more willing to join this collaborative um, partnership. And so that's the basic idea of the quadratic voting as applied to presidential hackathon. Um, so I know this question will come. Um, right, so yes. Uh, right, so might as well to get it over with. Um, so. <laughs> Um, so five people would like to, to know, how do I feel about the minister in charge of IT in Japan? So I, I don't know the minister personally. Uh, unfortunately, that I've read uh, many newspaper uh, and Twitter uh, comparisons, mostly around age. Uh, I, I think this is not really fair, <laughs> because um, first of all, that in Taiwan, the minister in charge of science and technology, uh, there's two ministers, minister uh, of science and technology, as well as the horizontal minister in charge of the board of science and technology, and they're both um, my father's age or older than my father, uh, but we still maintain very good uh, cross-generational uh, solidarity working in the cabinet. And so I'm the digital minister, but I'm not really the IC team uh, minister. Um, my work is mostly about digital transformation, meaning that enabling new kind of institutional design powered by technologies, but I don't work on, for example, the um, IT protocol uh, myself. That is the purview of the science and technology uh, ministry. And so so basically, I work on the application layer, so to speak, uh, and, and not really the uh, IT layer, which requires a different kind of thinking, I guess. So, um, and this is just a general observation. I think uh, in the cabinet, we need people of both parts across different generations, people who are more versed uh, in a um, top-down vertical notion of doing things, and people like me who are much more versed in the horizontal leadership. And if we don't have uh, both uh, roles in the cabinet, it's very easy to for the me mechanism to uh, start fossilizing. Even horizontal designs can fossilize really quickly. Uh, but if you do the design in a way that is uh, cross-cutting, that has most of the horizontal designs in place, but also very good vertical command control structures, uh, it actually becomes a much more fluid uh, design overall. So um, I don't know how exactly the uh, IT is being um, talked about in, in Japan, but I uh, tried to uh, work with the Code for Japan. I don't know whether anyone here is from Code for Japan. Uh, which is a community here that runs workshops with the local um, public service as well as people in the cabinet office about important aspects like how to enable teleworking uh, while uh, enabling that people to trust the cybersecurity involved in teleworking as well as uh, how to popularize the Japan system of electronic signature while uh, making sure that people who love the, the seals uh, can still get some cultural, um, I don't know, satisfaction uh, by the use of maybe Bluetooth seal-like devices or things like that. Uh, and so just to find common values despite the different generations' positions, I think that uh, is very important. And so I, I don't know the minister personally, but I think it's rather unfortunate that <laughs> there is kind of one individual versus one individual comparison because uh, my work wouldn't be as effective if not for uh, the ministers of my father's age that uh, can actually deliver the implementation of those ideas in a very uh, efficient as well as top-down manner. So um, next question, um, Hong Kong. So 11 people would like to know, uh, in Hong Kong, people are hiding personal information in order to avoid police censorship. Does the radical transparency only work in certain condition? This is a great question. Um, so 
I actually, the radical transparency applies to the content that was set, but there are arrangements where people really would like to choose a pseudonym. And generally, in my conversations, as well as in the e-petition, we do allow for pseudonyms. Um, of course, there's risk of civil attack and everything, so um, we really do have to make sure that you're a, a real person. Um, when you're making a petition, for example, it's verified using SMS and so on. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, when presenting to the community, you can choose a pseudonym uh, so as to protect uh, yourself. Now you would say uh, the SMS um, is usually verified with ID, that's true, but you can also use a prepaid SIM card uh, that is purchased on the grocery store. So it would take actually a lot of effort to, to track it back. You you can have your friends buy it, for example. And, and so there is some leeway uh, in uh, not really going full real name, but we also want to increase the uh, cost of getting new identity on the petition platform. Otherwise, people would just register 5,000 emails and get every petition uh, on the way. And that, of course, wouldn't work as well. So we chose the SIM card with pseudonym as kind of the um, just compromise uh, about it. So yes, I think the question is, of course, factually correct. The radical transparency works um, when everybody involved is comfortable with it. And in different social configurations, people's comfort level may be different. Uh, and, but that's why Slido is great, because uh, on Slido, people can choose pseudonyms, can choose to be anonymous. But people can also, at any given time, uh, change to their real name or just raise your hand and identify and claim uh, that question as something that you have asked. And so this kind of gradual uh, knob uh, of uh, anonymity, pseudonymity, and real name identity is what we have always tried to uh, design into our process so that people are not um, afraid of uh, whistleblowing or starting a petition uh, in a very unpopular um, position. But uh, at some time when the presidential hackathon, for example, uh, many public servants roll into the uh, presidential hackathon knowing that their director general is not approving of their idea. But because we design it such that they can work with their social sector friends, just a random hacker from the open source community proposing that idea, even when reading the project description, we know it's somebody from the public service, probably a section chief, uh, that have written the text. But the proposer is somebody, a random hacker from the open source community. And the section chief would say, oh, this addresses things per pertaining to my purview. So I would just collaborate with this outside hacker, uh, even though they wrote it themselves. Uh, but in any case, if it doesn't work over the course of three months, then it doesn't work. They stay completely under the radar. Their director general doesn't even know uh, that uh, this idea is um, of that section chiefs. But uh, when one of their ideas actually become uh, a winner of the presidential hackathon, for example, this particular one, it's not until that they won the presidential trophy that the actual proposer came out and say, hey, I propose this idea of using machine learning to parse through the prosecution of uh, all the uh, documents, public prosecution documents of companies that engage in illicit financial flows and trading with shell companies, as well as all the public information uh, disclosed by public listed companies. And they really chained a machine learning model that can predict with pretty good accuracy uh, which company in the next quarter is going to be accused of uh, violating the anti-money laundering or uh, the illicit financial flow. So it's actually a really good idea, but uh, he's actually an entry-level public servant uh, in the tax bureau, uh, and so uh, his directors are really not into that idea, uh, but, but, but because he can now project the you know, president's image <laughs> where, wherever, I can summon the president, so he just came forward and said, hey, I work in the tax bureau, I'm actually a public servant. Uh, but uh, had, had they not won the presidential hackathon, they can just become you know, totally anonymous and under the radar. And so <laughs> having this kind of design where people can be absolved of the risk of innovating, but still take the credit when the innovation works. I think that's also very important when we're designing a mechanism that rewards people uh, for uh, proposing the ideas that are genuinely, they believe, uh, good for the public and have a sandbox to try for three months that it's genuinely good uh, for the public. So theoretically, of course, this question is right, uh, very, very much right on the spot, but we can always do multi-step design so that people are required to review more and more of themselves, but only when the, the risk is also lower and lower uh, guaranteed, and that uh, their, the credit associated with it is also more and more. So eight people would like to know, what's the main goal of radical exchange? So radical exchange, as I explained, um, is the main goal is here. Um, developing institutional reform ideas on voting, 
public goods financing data markets to officials um, in various places, and so to further uh, the possibility of cooperating across difference. So, so that is the status goal. All those institutional design, mechanism design, whatever, is just to look, uh, take a hard look at our inherited institutions and traditions, and figuring out the silos or the bad designs, the inefficient design, that punish people for cooperating, that punish people for proposing good social innovation idea, that punish people from revealing their true preferences, and then uh, turn it around and start rewarding people for doing those pro-social things. So that's the idea of radical exchange. And it doesn't have to be uh, quadratic voting. It doesn't have to be quadratic financing or any of those ideas that Glenn has outlined uh, in the book. It could be totally outside the book. As long as this is really about promoting cooperation across difference, I think it's well within the spirit of radical exchange. Um, so... Quadratic voting, as we can see, is actually uh, very intuitive. Um, our ex little experiments with the presidential hackathon show that people generally get the idea. And we are now also kind of, uh, what's the word here, drinking our own champagne uh, in, the <laughs> um, in the Radical Exchange Foundation. Um, and so um, this is a, a real um, voting ballot. And this is built with the great technology called as the spreadsheet, uh, which is very portable. <laughs> We don't need specialized uh, software. We would just, you know, write some spreadsheet. Um, and so you can also very easily replicate it. Um, and so this is uh, our, our actual uh, blind ballot. Um, so each of us, um, all the board members in Radio Exchange, meet uh, through the great internet uh, every qu quarter. And every quarter, each person can... Um, propose resolutions for other people to uh, vote on. And then we have a, of course, deliberative structure where we talk about the pros and cons and have long email, um, you know, flame wars, not really flame wars, uh, but <laughs> long email threads uh, talking about each uh, proposal's merits and things like that. But then uh, at the end of it, we have to make a resolution. So uh, at the beginning of uh, forming of the board, we first are making a meta resolution saying that whatever we decide through quadratic voting will we'll affirm by unanimous vote because the New York City um, bylaws doesn't quite recognize the quadratic voting. So we have to first bind ourselves uh, to whatever that's result of quadratic voting. We have to make it also then another unanimous vote uh, to make it true. And then uh, the resolution, very simply put, is a one-line description of what's to be resolved. And then uh, we can approve or disapprove it. So each of the board member can vote yay or nay. Um, and so like... 25 means that I feel moderately strong, I guess, about adopting quadratic voting. But I can also vote nay, uh, which then would, um, of course, I wouldn't want to cancel my own vote. Uh, so I would vote zero here uh, and then vote something there. Uh, to show that I disapprove of this. And so uh, all the resolutions that have more yay votes than nay votes uh, become then the board's resolution. So again, I mean, this is very intuitive. I don't have to share the source code of this spreadsheet. You can probably code up this spreadsheet in an hour uh, or maybe one minute, actually. Uh, it's structurally very simple. And then uh, the, the good thing is that it also uh, let us only express opinions on things that we feel strongly or know something about. So if for this quarter, all the resolutions is something that I don't care or that I don't understand, I don't really have to vote. So um, that's the idea of a carryover voice credit. So each quarter, each board member receive uh, 100 fresh uh, voting credit, but all the unused of voting credits will be carried over into the next quarter with the depreciation of one quarter. And so that means that maybe the first quarter I have 100. If I don't use it, then it depreciates by one quarter. So the next quarter I'll have 175 and, and, and so on and so forth. But once voice credit never exceeds 400 for obvious reasons. Uh, and so people are still motivated to vote once in a while, at least once in a year. Otherwise, your voice credits will, will depreciate to the point that it's not really uh, useful to keep them anymore. And so there is, again, this idea of using market mechanism to reward each board member to review their true preferences, even though in the 
deliberative uh, phase where people generally feel okay about this, it still is very useful for the person that proposed this resolution to gauge at exactly what, how strongly people feel uh, about the particular project. Uh, even if everybody feels uh, it's okay about it, maybe nobody wants to spend any voice credit on it or just one or just four voice credits on it. And then people can very easily gauge the, the general feeling as well as form much more effective partnerships around things that we feel actually much more strongly about. And so this is a really low threshold social technology. You can start adopting it for your next board meeting. It's actually very easy to implement. So that's the part about quadratic voting, and I hope that answers some of this question. So um, one follow-up question. How do you resolve if votes are tied uh, for two ideas? Well, for, for board meeting, that's that's not a problem because if the votes are yay, as long as it's positive, we're just going to uh, resolve and just pass them through. And But if in the presidential hackathon, uh, people have um, this exactly the same uh, votes for the top 20, then maybe we just make the top 20 the top 21. But with a very large participating user base, it's actually very difficult because for quadratic voting, everybody can vote anywhere from one to nine votes for each project. So we actually, it's much harder to get ties uh, compared to uh, regular uh, approval voting or regular uh, one vote per, per person or n votes per person. So, uh, so far we've not uh, run into a place where we really need to do tie breaking. So, but we'll probably just include both of them. Um, so, five people would like to know, can I explain how does Taiwan citizens identify themselves on these e-services? Is a countrywide online identity framework? Yes. So, we do have a EID card, uh, much like Estonia. And like Estonia, uh, it's up in, so people don't have to use it. I think maybe one in three people use it, uh, mostly for text filing, but uh, very soon also for online referendum uh, signature collection and things like that. And starting late next year, we're going to reprint our paper uh, ID card, and we will include as an option for you to enable the PKR card as part of that ID card, but you don't have to. Again, it's up end. But we look forward to raise from maybe one in three people to maybe one in two people uh, opting in for the national PKR card. But again, it's it's not mandatory. Uh, I think Japan is has a kind of my number or something like that. Uh, that's also maybe one in four people, one in five people. Uh, so we're, we're roughly in the same boat. We're not in uh, kind of Estonia, where um, maybe nine out of ten people uh, are making active use of the PKR card, but we're gradually getting there. Uh, and it's roughly speaking the same identity framework. It's government issued, it's uh, public key cryptography, um, it's pretty good um, you know, uh, privacy, <laughs> not that pretty good privacy, uh, on uh, electronic signature, uh, and people are also entitled to download their um, data, we call it my data, so that if you have data entrusted to a public administration or public agency, like your healthcare data and so on, uh, you can get a copy of that. You can also uh, authorize some third, third party application to process that, as well as understand what that third party application is doing, accessing uh, your personal data and so on. So we have a pretty good uh, design to make sure that uh, across different ministries, they cannot really look at the raw data. So if you trust your privacy data to the Ministry of Health and Welfare, the Ministry of Interior cannot really look at the raw data without a law authorizing that. But they can look at statistics, and there's also ways to work on statistic collaborations between different agencies as well as between different uh, sectors. So that's pretty much our identity framework. Um, so um, five people has an interesting question. Uh, what avoids that you actually don't save the information of a meeting or meet in a random place like a house? Um, so I think that question is about what if I choose to meet in a non-office space and do some binding decisions um, over that but without disclosing it? Well, first of all, um, the protocol, which is uh, in visit.pdis.tw, um, actually takes care of that. It says from the section 3.1, uh, it could be uh, meeting in the executive yuan, or it could be meeting in my office space. So if you look at the office space, it's actually linking to OpenStreetMap, um, which is good, I guess. But then uh, it also says that if I um, 
conduct this in my official residence or indeed any non-office space, then um, we should make an audiovisual recording. And and so basically, the recording strength um, is different uh, depending on different physical location. If this is one of the office spaces where I'm always accompanied, as people still um, have a kind of copy of what's being talked about, um, then. Just people would then trust that if I'm, um, you know, not recording things uh, verbatim, uh, I still have a accompanying uh, colleague, and my office is actually one delegate from each ministry. So those delegates don't really work for me; they still work for their minister, and, and so <laughs> they will make sure that what is uh, being talked about is kosher. And if um, there is entreating or lobbying behavior, they will just fill this form uh, and forward it along. And so basically, there is very little chance of uh, a off record meeting if it's in my office space, but uh, if it's in uh, privacy-oriented um, spaces like my official residence, then uh, the protocol extends to say that it has to record the entire audiovisual. So for example, David Plouffe, actually, uh, that visit was in my official residence. So if you go to YouTube, you can actually see not only a recording, but actually a 360 recording uh, from the uh, f first time that doorbell rang to the time that he walks out. Uh, you can just put on VR glasses and feel how it's like to have a conversation uh, about Uber. Uh, and that is basically uh, the way to uh, prove to the people uh, in general that uh, First, I would choose the official meeting space wherever possible, but also if it is not the official meeting space, then it's um, made into an official um, space-ish by making sure that the entrance as well as the exit of the visitor is both uh, recorded. And because my schedule is also uh, public to all the different delegates uh, to my office and everybody can actually see uh, what my office is working on, it's using a very standard um, technology called WeCan, which is a fork, uh, or really a copy of Kanban. So everybody can also track uh, everything that we're working on. So it's actually very difficult to have a clandestine meeting uh, in, within the packed uh, schedules. And so people don't even try. So that is a um, basic response um, to, to this question. So um, before I answer the rest of the questions, I do want to get through um, at least some of the other ideas of radio exchange uh, as proposed by the communities. Uh, one logical extension to quadratic voting is called quadratic finance. Um, and this, you, you see this kind of diagram all the time, so um, it's maybe a good thing to explain it. Basically, uh, as I explained, you can vote for one vote and it will cost you one point and four points will be two votes. So basically the point roughly corresponds to the area of these blocks and the strength, that is to say its actual effect, uh, roughly correspond to the height of those blocks. So if you see a lot of block diagram uh, when um, we talk about the quadratic whatever papers, uh, that's what is being meant. Um, it's not exactly intuitive. Um, I tried to uh, convince um, the presidential hackathon team to do the voting in the form of a um, glass like this, where people can pour, I don't know, liquid <laughs> into it, and then um, the kind of liquid you pour into uh, will be also quadratic <laughs> uh, to the effect uh, of the strength of your votes, uh, but they think this is not actually more intuitive than blocks, and so <laughs> they, they just did away with that. So um, anyways, but, <laughs> but w w whatever um, metaphor you use, this is the, the effect of uh, quadratic voting. And so quadratic finance says, say um, that uh, the government have matching funds, uh, as we actually do, uh, to a lot of uh, public funding projects. And most of the time, we want to fund projects that serves a, a wider public interest, but we also want to incentivize people to bring uh, more of their funding uh, into it. So we want two things. First, that we want uh, match matchable funding from the crowdfunding scene. But second, we want the crowd part in the crowdfunding as well. And so quadratic finance is a very simple way to say um, if you only have one person in the community caring about this project, then they will just self-fund the project because obviously nobody else thinks it's a good idea. But pre people can signify, uh, signal that it's a good idea just by putting very small amounts of votes into it. So for example, this red project here, 
there's five people caring about it, and the area is not really larger than the purple one, but it shows that more people are benefiting from this project, so the government or the co-op or whatever um, organization wanted to implement project finance will take it as a signal that more people want it to happen, and so match uh, according to the height of this basically making it the, a full block, um, a quadratic. And again, this one uh, will get not as much matching funding, but at least it benefits two uh, parties. And so they will take care of almost half of the funding, uh, while the cooperative or the government takes care of the other half of the funding. So this is just a intuition. You can uh, change the parameters however you want. But the basic idea is that uh, we want a social signal from people who maybe don't have that much um, extra money laying around uh, crowdfunding, but they can use just you know one dollar to signify that they really want to see this happen. And once they get a sizable uh, following, uh, the government or the co-op in question can use that signal to know that they really want to uh, offer the matching fund to make that happen first. Uh, but if nobody else cares about any particular project, then that project doesn't really warrant uh, using the public money in the cooperative of the government. So that's just a very logical extension of the quadratic voting idea, using that as a signal of uh, the social benefit. Um, so, um, right, so feel free just to, to walk in and out. I understand there's many other sessions going on. <laughs> um, and so the second uh, half of this talk, I would just go back to the questions. And I mean, if you, um, any of you want to start raising your hands, that's excellent as well. Well, there's 20 questions, so we better get to it. Um, <laughs> right. um, four people would like to know, how would I measure the success of my policies? That's a great question. Um, so in Taiwan, uh, we have this um, idea of a dashboard. So each of our sustainable development goals have uh, a different implementation um, in that dashboard. So I'll just use uh, one example, uh, SDG 5, gender equality just to use that as an example of how we usually do um, impact measurement. So, um, of course, we know that Taiwan is the first country in Asia that legalized marriage equality, yay. Uh, and uh, Taiwan did this uh, in a way that is, thank you. <laughs> um, well, this is, this is quite, Qualitative, right? <laughs> but, uh, but there's also, of course, quantified benefits um, of uh, enabling marriage equality. But uh, we're also uh, looking at this uh, from a very practical standpoint because there was a constitutional ruling that says um, uh, marriage equality must be implemented regardless of um, sexual orientation. But then uh, there's also two referenda, uh, two national referendums. One say that uh, the civic code uh, regarding um, heterosexual marriage uh, must keep as is without uh, redefining what it means uh, in the civil code. But another referendum also says that we must protect marriage equality, but without, um, you know, calling it the marriage in the civil code. And so the Korea Public Service is faced with a very well-defined, that is just a very difficult uh, solution space that have to conform to the constitutional ruling and the two referenda and without offending anyone. Uh, and then, but very kind of miraculously, uh, with just a few short months, uh, they delivered a what we call the Hyperlink Act, uh, which is a new act that, um, that defines um, same-sex marriage but all its content is just hyperlinks back to the civil code. And that says uh, same-sex marriage is defined as such, and they enjoy exactly the same rights and benefits of the marriage in civil code. Uh, but what it does uh, re really well is that it hyperlinks all the bylaws, meaning that all the rights and obligations are hyperlinked through. But it doesn't hyperlink to the section that talked about the in-laws, uh, because in East Asia um, culture, at least in Taiwan, uh, we have 16 different words for, for aunt and uncle, uh, meaning that people really care <laughs> about the, the kinship relationship. And indeed, before 2007, there, the marriage is an entirely social one. You don't have to register for your marriage if you have a public ceremony involving both uh, families. Uh, it should signify the um, marriage not only of the two people, but actually there are two families. Then you're wed. Uh, you can register after the fact. If you don't register, it doesn't matter. The marriage still stands. But after 2008, we switch to a 
registration-based marriage, and then marriage is just about you know two people with two witnesses registering at a desk, and whether they have a ceremony or not is really not uh, the government's business. And so, because we changed the definition of marriage kind of midway, uh, different people from different generation have very different ideas about marriage. And so, uh, when we legalized the bylaws, we took special care in saying that, but it's not touching the in-laws. So when two same-sex people wet, there, it says nothing about their family relationships. And that really is the key to convince the people of the older generation, the social marriage ceremony um, people, to uh, see this as something distinct from the marriage as they knew it, which is not uh, part of the law anymore, but they still have fond memories about it. Um, but that, that, that isn't being encroached by the uh, same-sex marriage. But the same-sex marriage, of course, enjoy exactly the same uh, rights and obligations. So why can the public service uh, figure out this so quickly? That's because they have um, data. So um, first of all, the, the MPs like it, uh, and partly because our MPs are very gender balanced. Um, th this is a slide that I used in Canada. So I just compare with jurisdictions near Canada and Taiwan. Uh, if I'm going to uh, talk in Scandinavia, I'm not going to uh, sh show this slide because they have far more women in their parliament. But we're, <laughs> we're, we're doing pretty well uh, in terms of North American and East Asian um, standards. <laughs> and so there's a, a lot more uh, balance um, in the parliament. But aside from the parliament, really the uh, administrative branch is where the measurement of progress is real, really done. And this is been, has been going on for 12 years. All the projects and bills um, are reviewed by this gender equality committee, which is by design a uh, multi-stakeholder committee with 17 ministers and 17 plus one civil society leaders. And so if they really go to a vote, the social sector will win and the public sector will lose. Um, so that incentivized the ministers really actively participate in the gender uh, equality uh, council. And then with that council, all the projects, which is about 200 every year, and all the bills that we propose to the uh, legislation, which is about 20 per year, um, must include a very detailed assessment of the impact that they are trying to do uh, on gender equality on one particular sustainable goal. And uh, everything they collect gets into the gender dashboard, which keeps refreshing even when the project is over. So this is one uh, particular example. This is talking about the Employment Service Act or the ESA from the Ministry of Labor, and they have to start ticking a lot of boxes um, and analyzing the current status and problems and what uh, gender-related kind of top-level goals. Uh, so it's to help women to, who leave the workplace to find employment, and then what's their solution to the problem, and during the solution, uh, have they considered the necessity, what are the supporting measures, what are the concrete policy goals, and this is where you get from the qualitative to the quantitative, and who are the groups affected by the legislation, have you uh, done any external consultation with those external groups? What are those P KPRs suggested by the external groups affected by the legislation? Uh, which relative authorities have you consulted? What are the pre, um, uh, previously agreed uh, benefits of those uh, policies as agreed by those external consultations? Are there any constitutional um, uh, considerations? And what about international covenants? And so on and so forth. And this is actually just um, one third. And I'm just to spare you the rest. But the idea is that each and every analysis, each and every quantitative uh, term in this analysis is then turned into a data set. So if this policy calls for measuring gender balance um, in the numbers of volunteers in the health department or the labor force participation rate, Proportion of female executive in the administration, proportion of people uh, working as principals to schools or high schools, and so on. Um, if they mention any term, then we start measuring it. And once we start measuring it, uh, it never ends. And so this is an ever-increasing gender dashboard. And that then informed the theory of change. People can actually very easily see which policy have reached, which missed its target, uh, which collateral damage or collateral benefit it did uh, to the gender equality. And much more importantly, it forces people 
not only in the Ministry of Labor, which obviously have something to, to do with gender, but also ministries of finance, ministry of economic development, uh, to start considering about gender uh, impact, even if their uh, job doesn't usually cover it. And if they forget to consult the external groups or whatever, uh, then the majority civil society leader, who all have to review each and every of those assessments, will kindly remind them of it. And without their approval, actually, the project never clears the cabinet meeting. And so because of that, they really have to go back and then the consult um, people. And so that basically is the idea. We have very similar arrangement for other sustainable development goals, but the idea is that we just keep measuring the things that are identified by stakeholders as important uh, in the consultation meetings. And once we run the project, even after it's finished, we never stop uh, measuring it. And so this is just a uh, standardized way to measure for um, gender equality, but we're also going to introduce a very similar one for the open government as well as part of our national action plan on open government uh, for SDG 16. And so that's the basic idea. So um, the measurement is, yes, finally somebody raised their hand. <laughs> Last week I was just in Buenos Aires. <laughs> I, I, I'm still adjusting from a lag. <laughs> so, so I, I think uh, from my understanding, Argentina has also really started looking into international measurement theories of change in the past three years. Uh, of course, it's hard to you know finish everything in three years, but uh, I think it's generally moving to the right direction uh, with the international um, standard components so that we can enable independent assessment uh, through the different uh, policy areas. I think the um, most important thing in Taiwan when we're adopting this kind of um, very progressive measurement is that we always keep the social sector of a higher legitimacy than the public sector. And this is really the kind of secret sauce of Taiwan's uh, democracy because um, Taiwan used to be under martial law, uh, but it got lifted in 1987. But our presidential election is 96, so there's 10 years between uh, people have the right to assemble and free speech and the presidential election. And so the civil society has 10 years of head start to build legitimacy. <laughs> and the administration had no uh, legitimacy other than the, what's inherited from the um, martial law era. Uh, so when we start really democratizing, there's already very strong um, civil society organizations that are perfectly fine, raising their funds, even rolling out their products and services, even people donating so regularly to it that they get a very much like tax-like income and so on. So with those social organizations, uh, making sure that the government is measuring according to what they want, they often just set up a, um, like the Gender uh, Equality Council, a governance mechanism that involves the government, but is not dominated by the government. The government has, strictly speaking, a minority seat in it, so they will invite the government government in, in to participate and get the legitimacy that the so, so social credit, they, not that social credit, the credit from the society uh, that they uh, have accumulated, but then the government never gets to control it. So I think that really is the, the key. Uh, and I will use um, another example, um, which is the, the air box which is also have something to do with distributed ledgers. So I think it's good to share it here. Uh, but uh, this is one of the, the more popular uh, citizen science projects. In Taiwan, people care about the uh, air quality, like PM 2.5 pollution and things like that. And so people just bought those very cheap, like less than 100 US dollars devices, and put them in their balcony, their primary school, or whatever, their office space, and start just reporting to a, a distributed ledger um, what their measured air quality is. And, and the ledger is great, because because otherwise people would uh, question the numbers and maybe you know people would uh, before the day before election accuse each other of going back and change the numbers but let's just make sure that this doesn't happen uh, and so all those 2,000 or so stations are entirely operated by um, people by citizens and they don't have any government funding and when this started the Environmental Protection Agency has maybe 77 stations. And so you're, of course, going to trust the station that nearby you, maybe not as precise as the national one, but uh, in any case, it's much closer to your home, right? Because of that, uh, when I shared this slide with many nearby jurisdictions in Asia, um, they were bewildered and said that in their jurisdiction, if there's some uprising like this, they will try to buy off the leader of the technology and recruit them into the government. Uh, and if they refuse uh, by the 
200 station, uh, they will try to discredit or maybe disappear them. And and this is <laughs> this is this is true. I mean, this really threatens the government legitimacy. But because the government is so used to the social sector having more legitimacy, when things like airbox come around, we're just like, yeah, we can't beat them. We must join them. Uh, and so, <laughs> so we, we just start talking with them, saying, well, what do you need? What do you want? <laughs> and the, the the citizen scientist said, oh, we we want airboxes here, which is the uh, industrial park. Uh, they are private property. We suspect of them of air pollution. They say they're not even polluting anything. Uh, and we, there's a kind of squabble going on. So we're like, yeah, we can help. Uh, it turns out that we own the lamps within the industrial park. So we can just hang their air boxes using their protocol right into their ledger, but on the uh, lamps on the industrial park. Or people say, I want to, to measure the uh, air quality here because I want to tell domestic versus over the street um, air quality. Um, but they can't really measure there. I mean, people did try to fly a drone there, but you know, battery technology being what it is, uh, it really can't stay at air very uh, long. Uh, so it's very costly for a citizen scientist to measure air quality there, but people are interested in, in that spot. And we're like, yeah, we're building a lot of wind turbines, renewable energy plants there, so we can just amend the contract and say anyone who want to con uh, construct a wind turbine must also do some air quality measurement and write to the citizen's ledger uh, on the <laughs> citizen's uh, airbox network. And so basically the public sector always plays a supportive role. And, and that has two benefits. First, that people learn that if they don't like what the government is doing, they don't argue for a larger government, uh, which as I understand is some part of the culture of the Argentina culture is that <laughs> if people feel the government isn't doing something, they just advocate of the government doing more of it and, and enlarging the, the government. But when people feel that they have more legitimacy than the government, then their natural tendency is just to do it themselves. And, and so the government doesn't have to keep uh, growing in numbers. They don't have to keep taxing people more. So that's the first benefit. And the second one is that because using distributed ledgers and open innovation, we actually can engage with people around the world. Uh, that just download the Airbox code from GitHub. That just starts a Raspberry Pi or Arduino or whatever. Uh, open hot and people who want to apply to other domains like water box, uh, some kind of water quality measurement can freely do so. And so open innovation also makes sure that the government doesn't have to take on the maintenance role. Uh, so the innovation is done by social sector and the uh, maintenance is collectively shared by businesses, private sector, social entrepreneurs that uh, see a business model out of it. And so the public sector does the minimal, which is uh, you know hanging air boxes on lamps in industrial parks. So <laughs> I think that really is the, the answer to your question is just to have a good cross-sectoral relationship. Yes. Yeah, uh, that, that's the, the topic of this talk, right? It's called radical exchange. So, uh, anything that can incentivize this kind of voluntary collaboration without a centralized government um, um, like top-down um, design. So it's, it's still policy design, but it's planning in a more humble way. It's just us saying, you know, people have different positions. Is there a way to make them uh, much more willing to share their common values instead of just fighting on different positions? And if we keep asking this question, um, then people are actually much uh, more willing to to entertain the idea that maybe there are um, common values after all, despite different positions. And so I think radical exchange is a really good umbrella. When I was in Buenos Aires, there's actually a chapter in uh, Buenos Aires and also in, in Chile. Um, and so people, when I walk into, so I gave a public talk in this uh, politi political and judiciary um, department, but that uh, department in the university uh, is sharing its uh, office space with the Department of Finance uh, on market design and mechanism design. So uh, just random people studying economics are also <laughs> in, in my talk, and, and there's a very fruitful umbrella because radical exchange means that people can apply their uh, market design, mechanism design ideas in the public space through social innovation. So everybody feels that they can have something to contribute. Even if they're not yet a minister, they can still contribute it uh, from the um, level of their uh, university or their uh, community college.
go up or their um, apartment uh, um, management uh, for their com community complex or things like that. And so uh, it can start at a very uh, small level, but the uh, lessons learned can very easily be scaled up and scaled out as well. So I think RxC is a pretty good umbrella term for people who want to experiment uh, with that idea without uh, having a okay from the public sector. The public sector can join after the fact. So that's essentially the kind of line of uh, persuasion that we're now talking to various different uh, countries. Uh, it's basically saying, you know, Colorado, Taiwan, or whatever, uh, did something, and it looks very shiny. And then we understand this requires political will that you probably don't have. But if you just use this spreadsheet in your next meeting, <laughs> then your meeting gets better. And, and so basically a, a high enough um, like pilot, but with a uh, low enough uh, threshold of joining. And that's the basic idea of how RxC tried to get into different jurisdictions. Oh, oh uh, buying votes. Right. Yeah. So, so that's that's a really good question. So, um, for presidential hackathon, uh, we actually like people to buy votes <laughs> because we want more people to learn about these ideas. Uh, and really, it's only about setting the relative priority anyway. And so, people are going to mobilize voters uh, with with social buying or you know just mobilizing their users to vote for them. The thing is that once you get into the voting apparatus, there really is no easy way uh, to um, attest that you have voted exactly like that. Because unlike electronic voting, um, the central tallying is only done in our application. So um, even if you screenshot uh, your process of voting, you can easily also fake that screen casting and still vote for something else. So um, there's no easy way to for people to systemically buy votes. That's the first thing. And the second thing is that even with social, I wouldn't say buying, but encouraging uh, people to vote for you, uh, what we have seen from the log is that when they vote uh, as instructed, nine votes, uh, everything to one project, they still have 18 points left and they still look at other projects. And many people just take away from the initial votes once they find something that they know more about. Uh, and so we see this over and over again with the design that uh, we introduce. Before we use quadratic voting, we also used a um, AI-based uh, conversation method called uh, POLIS. And the POLIS, which is um, having this structure, uh, basically asks people to come to a website and look at one sentiment from one fellow citizen, and they can vote agree or disagree. And as they do so, their avatar move among the people that share similar sentiments as they do. Uh, but there's no reply button, because if you have a reply button, the trolls win the day. They have more time on their hands. But if you don't have the reply button, people after voting a few yes or no's, they will start just sharing their ideas for other people to vote on. And what we have um, seen is that even for very controversial topics, um, like uh, when we did this for UberX and then Airbnb, Airbnb mobilizes uh, the voters by sending an email to to all the Airbnb members in Taiwan and say, go to the police website and vote for Airbnb. But because uh, the vote is a multi-dimensional space, like in QV, your, your voting is uh, actually very dynamic. It's not a binary yes or no question. Uh, in police, when they go to uh, the website, we have seen that people who are recruited by Airbnb, actually only less than one third stuck to the Airbnb position. After they <laughs> see a few uh, new sentiments from their fellow citizens, they start thinking, oh, maybe it still needs some regulation uh, and, and things like that. And, and they move toward a much more nuanced way. So my point is that uh, we are so used to voting being very asymmetric. We, uh, in representative democracy, we upload maybe four bits every four years. Uh, and But <laughs> the, the, the policy decision that impacts us is highly asymmetrical. Uh, but in this kind of day-to-day -day, uh, participatory democracy, uh, we try to design the spaces so that people can upload a lot of bits. So for a statement, uh, you upload one bit, and each police conversation maybe has 50 statements, so everybody contributes 50 bits uh, into the discussion. And if you send another statement for other people to vote on, you essentially extend the solution space by another dimension. And so people start uh, participating much more. And once you have this bandwidth, it's actually very hard for people to buy vote. Uh, the concept of buying vote actually kind of dissipates because it's a dynamic space where people have a lot of more flexibility. And especially that people can see after each conversation or um, each vote, 
that there are really only a few things that people disagreed on. And people mostly agree on most of things most of the time by most of the people. And, and this is actually a very powerful picture for any democracy to look at because uh, if you look only at institutional media or even some social media, people would think that there's only those five things that dominates people's attention across party lines, across ideological lines, across whatever other lines. But um, actually people have much more in common. It's just they don't spend calories uh, talking about that. Uh, and so this is an actual uh, picture. We always get this picture, but this one in particular um, is from uh, Kentucky, uh, US, Bowling Green. Um, and as you can see, the topmost group informed consensus, uh, no matter what, whatever their position is on, I don't know, gun control or something, um, <laughs> that what, whichever group they are on, they broadly agree that the basic education they have at the moment uh, is concentrated on science, technology, engineering, and math. But everybody think uh, the STEM need to become STEAM uh, by adding art to it. And it, this is somewhat surprising um, because people don't spend much calories talking about it. But people are surprised to find, no matter whether you're a Democrat or a Republican, everybody agree that arts are important in the STEAM education. And uh, schools are not doing that. So why don't we just go ahead and do it? There's really nobody who cannot live with this idea. And so this kind of uh, symmetric bandwidth where people can contribute much more bits into public discussion makes it almost impossible to buy votes because this is emergent. Um, this is crowdsourced agenda. Nobody can beforehand say you have to support art in education because that is literally generated during the process. And the same for the presidential hackathon. So if you vote for issues for priorities, or like Slido, vote for questions. It's always easier for people with the uh, large enough crowd to uh, assemble something that is creative. But if you're voting for people, of course, that's much harder. And so that is the basic answer, I hope. Yes, a, a follow up. Yeah, it, it's true. I mean, if you want to kind of, as a group, uh, get more subsidies uh, from the government, you would then motivate a lot of people who don't really care about this project to nevertheless spend $1 to care about the project. So that is a, a valid concern. And I think one of the um, kind of counter argument to this is that, but you also introduce people who otherwise wouldn't care about this whole setup at all to start caring about <laughs> this setup. And therefore, they have much more room to signal that their interest in other projects as well, because they wouldn't actually just spend their time, vote on your project, and go away. Um, like in our e-petition platform, um, once you uh, join a petition, it does a kind of Amazon um, thing that says there's three other petitions that you may also be interested at, <laughs> and you might want to look at it as well. Uh, and so it gradually just gets more bits uh, from the participants. So I think when we're still spreading this idea, it actually makes sense to collaborate with people who want to buy votes because it's free advocacy. <laughs> but at some point, you would want to structurally uh, limit the, the option of buying votes at some point. Uh, but I think at the beginning, we the, these people are actually our friends. Yeah. So uh, there's a question on the back. So, good question. So, uh, for, for the polis conversation, uh, we're not showing the detailed analysis uh, until the very end. So, but people see a kind of general shape. Uh, and for quadratic voting as well, we're, we're not showing uh, during the voting the actual score uh, that, thing, uh, that the issues get. Um, it can actually be experimented both ways. Uh, one way of, the, one of the idea of showing the vote is that it will actually increase the participation rate for people who know that their uh, project is currently at the 21st place and they really want to mobilize people to put it into the top 20. Uh, on the other hand, um, that may actually uh, result in a lot of uh, by just two groups uh, mobilizing for different things. Um, but maybe that's a good idea. Maybe we should try that. <laughs> but uh, in the initial experiment, uh, we are uh, more conservative about it. So we basically said not even the jury uh, get to see the final result. The jury makes our feasibility assessment in independently, but we don't see the popularity part. Uh, we just do our feasibility ranking, and the popularity part uh, is open up uh, at the same time as we are feasibility uh, and innovation uh, ranking. And so the QV actually takes 30% uh, of the weight, uh, but the QV results are revealed in the presidential hackathon in the same time as the, the jury's uh, reports. But 
next time maybe we'll try to first also uh, increase the, the ratio of quadratic voting because uh, all the juries feel that they provide as good, actually better uh, signal than we do. So we really shouldn't claim 70%. Maybe we should claim maybe just 30%. We should flip that around. And the next thing is that we should also work out uh, roughly what ways to review um, just interim results uh, during the quadratic voting. That's a very fruitful line of thinking because I think it will also improve advocacy but to, to some degree. Yeah, we'll see. So what, what I really mean is that it's a good idea, and we'll think about it. Yes? Yeah. Right, so, so the numbers are out on, on GitHub for everybody to, to, to analyze. Uh, I think PETA's quadratic voting on GitHub. Uh, but in, uh, in a nutshell, uh, we found two things. First, people really don't want squandering their points. So even for people who just vote nine votes on a project and never change it, they will still want to spend the other 18 points uh, because nobody wants to squander their, their voice credits. And the second thing is that there are people who, after voting for the third or fourth project, realize that this one warrants more attention and take some of the initial votes out. But uh, I don't have the exact numbers of the percentage of people who actually did that. But because our comparison was with the you know, old system of, of people just go and vote and go, right? So, <laughs> as long as there are some percent of people who uh, result in more careful consideration, it's a win overall. Yeah, right, so um, that's a really good question. So with, some, uh, with the same uh, pseudonym uh, level of protection uh, for things like Slido or ePetition or Presidential Hackathon, it's very difficult to imagine a retaliation scenario, right? So <laughs> because of that, uh, zero knowledge is, is less desired because it's one more thing to explain but people don't really fear retaliation for preferring one SDG over another. It's very hard to imagine a retaliation scenario. Uh, but when voting for people, like voting for mayors or voting for president, of course there is a high likelihood of, of retaliation and for gaming as well. And that's when I think uh, the zero knowledge uh, technology starts being useful. Um, that actually uh, goes really well into the next uh, radical exchange idea, which is, um, no, not this one, uh, that's our president. Uh, so the radical exchange idea of um, data dignity. So um, basically, that's actually very relevant to your um, idea. There's this idea of privacy, right, about uh, the information that I know, or only I and my um, parents know, uh, but generally it's not known about us. But there's also the idea of inverse privacy, which is uh, large corporations or hospitals or whatever um, have data that I didn't explicitly give them. I just gave them as part of transaction. Uh, but because I'm not really well informed, they end up using those data to make decisions about me uh, without my full knowledge. And so that's kind of the idea of inverse privacy that uh, I, I'm not even aware that I have data that is in custody of the data operators. And, and that is what the data dignity um, idea from Radio Exchange is trying to address is basically saying um, we should uh, look at all the different technologies, uh, including zero knowledge technologies, but also differential privacy and um, split learning and also open algorithm, uh, all sort of toolkits that um, gets people first that what they care about is um, whether the people using their personal data is acting in their best interest, and whether they can know for sure that they're acting in their b best interest. And this is actually a very um, intuitive uh, understanding, because if I'm going to intentionally tell my personal information to my doctor, to my um, accountant, to my nurse or whatever, uh, my lawyer, I would say that it, the, the second they stop acting in my best interest is the time that I switch a lawyer or I switch a, a doctor, right? Um, but the problem of the current data operatives is that it's largely opaque. So even when they're acting in my best interest, there's no easy way for me to know that. Uh, and if they start to act not in my best interest, there's no easy way for somebody to, to write a SQL query or a uh, Sparkle query. Uh, and so me to just um, do this query to the data operator to find out whether they're acting in my best interest or things like that. And so um, have figuring out this relationship with large platforms. Uh, some of them are growing their um, governance uh, board and setting up their own Supreme Court as we speak and issuing their own cryptocurrency. Uh, but in, in any case, uh, we're, we're, what we're trying to figure out is how to establish a, a data collaborative relationship so that people in general don't have to all learn the uh, 
uh, intricate mathematics, but can translate their intuitions about the uh, um, data dignity that we are operating in the real world uh, before the internet, uh, like as I mentioned, the fiduciary uh, relationships with doctors and lawyers and whatever, and turn those uh, intuitive social questions and querying uh, into a shared um, protocol so that we can run this to all the telecom operators, all the social media operators, and so on, and to find out uh, whether they're actually acting in my best interest. And if they are not, uh, maybe they would like to compensate me somehow, or maybe I would just exercise my data portability rights and move it to some other operator. So that's the basic intuition about data dignity. Uh, it's, mm, I, I would say that it's in a art, like speculative design. It's sometimes hard to tell art and speculative design apart, but in any case, it's in, in an art slash speculative design space at this moment. Um, there are some mathematical, as you mentioned, uh, Independence of it, but the main communication uh, challenge now is just to make those mathematical underpinnings uh, intuitive to uh, everyday um, use, and so that we can gain the um, legitimacy from the society to start uh, introducing those legislations and norms. Not really legislations. Maybe start with norms uh, with the large corporations. So I don't really have a lot of time to get into the details, but if you Google for data dignity, there's several lines of thoughts around that as well as pretty. Uh, aren't uh, around the the space of uh, making toasts and things like that. So, but I, I will not um, spoil that. So, so that's the basic idea uh, around just privacy as a kind of relationship. Data is relationship, uh, and not as oil. There's really nothing comparable um, from oil to data. They are like exact opposites. Uh, but in any case, so um, any other questions from the audience? Yes. Uh, there's, there, so you, you first, yeah. Yeah, so, so my, that's a great question, is about uh, whether I can share some stories about people who are conservative and don't really want anything to do with this kind of public sector innovation and, and how I maybe change people's minds. Um, so I think that the trick here is that, so my three working condition is radical transparency, which I talk about, uh, location independence, anywhere I'm working, I'm working. That's why I can get those uh, very interesting uh, office hours uh, in the very creative space like the Social Innovation Lab, which, by the way, the soccer field is drawn by people with Down syndrome, uh, with trisomy differences. So we look at the world as numbers and text, but they view the world as geometry. Uh, and so instead of uh, treating them as vulnerable populations, uh, they are actually creative artists that make everybody creative uh, in this place. So that's my second working condition, is that I get to pick where I work. Uh, and But the third thing is voluntary association. So my office is kind of special because I'm a horizontal minister. In Taiwan, there's 32 vertical ministries, each with a vertical minister with a top-down um, commanding relationship. But above the 32, there's nine people uh, who are horizontal ministers and whose work is essentially reconciling the different values of different ministries. And so my office is one delegate from each ministry. So theoretically, I can have 32 volunteers from 32 ministries. But in reality, not all ministries have sent people, and that answers your question. For example, the Ministry of Defense never sent anyone. I wonder why. Maybe they don't like radical transparency. But <laughs> anyway, um, the Ministry of Continental China Affairs never sent anyone. I wonder why. <laughs> but after a year of uh, my work as digital minister, the Foreign Service actually sent somebody because they realized that there's a part of diplomacy called public diplomacy that they want the maximum of engagement and there's really no national secret. So the idea, very simply put, is that uh, people come to me if they want to work out loud, if they want to convey uh, through the cross-ministerial network their work to everybody. But if they uh, prefer to work in secret, I'm not going to knock on the Ministry of Defense door and say, tomorrow you have to live stream your meetings. I'm totally not doing that. So, because because of that, there's, there's less uh, pushbacks. But when we started the national petition platform, where people start realizing with 5,000 people joining, they can get a ministerial response. And some early successes, like a co-creation of a tax filing experience, because a designer petitioned saying the tax filing experience is explosively hostile. And, and then we invited everybody into co-creation and made a tax uh, filing service for this year that 98% uh, of people likes. So that's an early success story. 
there's also early success about uh, banning the plastic straws and replacing them with like sugar cane waste or some kind of circular economy material. That's also a success. So after a few of those early success, we get the weirdest um, petitions. There's a petition 8,000 people strong asking Taiwan to change the time zone to the same as Japan. So we're <laughs> UTC plus 8, and 8,000 people want to change to UTC plus 9. Uh, and <laughs> at the same time, 8,000 people want us to keep in UTC plus 8. Uh, <laughs> so you, you can't please uh, both sides. Uh, if you say we change to 8.5 pull in North Korea, um, and then that probably please nobody. <laughs> and so uh, we actually have to invite both sides into face-to-face -face meetings. And, and that's when the most ministries involved, after I started just bombarding them with the arguments that we got from the petition platform, that people said things like, uh, you changing the time zone will save energy, will increase uh, tourism, will increase uh, stock exchange trading, whatever. Uh, and uh, we, we pestered each ministry to come up with factual response of how it doesn't actually save energy, that it doesn't actually increase tourism unless you're willing to violate labor law, uh, and, and so on, and, and calculate a quantifiable like dollar value of the one-time cost of changing the time zone, and a recurring cost that we have to uh, continually pour into it. And many ministries are like, are, Minister, are you really seriously trying to respond to, to such a petition? But it turns out after revealing all this data, people then start to talk about their feelings. If you don't have people on the same page when it um, comes to facts, people just share their feelings on wildly different imagination scenarios. But if we have the facts and share the objective facts with everybody, uh, including the dollar value uh, that is going to be required on uh, change the time zone, people actually start sharing their, their true feelings. Like people who petitioned for plus nine started saying, we do this because we want Taiwan to be seen as more unique in the world. Uh, they want people traveling from the airports of Beijing and Shanghai having to change their clock for some reason, uh, <laughs> signifying different jurisdiction maybe. <laughs> And people on the on the other side of petition who is in the same room correctly points out first smartwatches and phones now auto adjust their time zone so people are not going to be aware of it uh, and uh, there's many jurisdictions with many time zones like Australia or the US right and and so I mean it really doesn't work and if we're going to spend that much money after all uh, it could be done in a much more effective way like popularizing and filming about marriage equality about human rights about democracy about referendum right about open government and so they started brainstorming and decided that maybe spending that money on this kind of promotion is much better than changing the time zone which are not going to have much of benefit other than giving us maybe five minutes of international uh, recognition and, and for silliness uh, and so we, we just wrote that response to both petitioners and then the ministries realized that if they don't tackle this in a factual fashion then people are just going to recurring uh, one that uh, every other time that there's a parliamentary um, session, uh, some legislator will uh, actually just take that and just start asking the same question over again. Uh, but if you just address those people's uh, questions and bring them into uh, the co-creation, then people will feel that they have went through this policy question. They will not be misled by misinformation. And then they will always think, oh, actually, that's not going to be cost effective. And we're going to promote Taiwan some other way. And so um, what started as kind of pushback or at least resistance from Korea Public Service uh, become actually much more better once they realize that, oh, this now 16,000 people uh, is going to help them <laughs> to uh, justify their public work uh, instead of just distracting them uh, through the changing of time zones. Uh, and so that gradually won their heart back by uh, realizing that there's no risk involved and the time they spend into it actually pays dividends uh, amortized over time. Uh, so there was, sorry, uh, so yeah. Well, I think they come to my office because they know that uh, there's literally 12 different ministries volunteering to join this program. So I'm not a single person. I'm somebody that can channel through uh, 12 different ministries and, and get them into the, the space of listening, of really understanding what they have to say. And so I think this kind of what we call servant leadership or horizontal leadership is really about getting 
sufficient amount of buy-in from your fellow um, colleagues and understanding that all they, they are giving is their attention and their ability to listen. And this technology is really only about listening at scale. And it's not about fighting a zero-sum uh, game or something like that. Uh, certainly that people vote on Slido is just about the uh, relative order that I answer the questions. It's not about uh, a referendum. It's not binding a legislative level. And so this uh, more weakened binding power of channeling through the different ministries, uh, I think is the main thing that I offer and why people come to my office hour. And I would also add that it's not only people come to my office hour, because after I set up the office hour, I realized that it's only people in Taipei or people living near a high-speed rail station. Uh, they can physically travel uh, to Taipei with no problem, like from the south of of Taiwan, it's just an hour and a half to travel to Taipei. But people who are in the rural areas, in the mountain areas in indigenous lands in offshore islands they don't really uh, have that convenience of just come to my office hours so if I just keep being in Taipei I will actually be biased uh, by the people visiting me so that's when I started intentionally every other Tuesday to visit the people who are least likely to come to my office hour and meet in their local habitat their local uh, meeting place so um, they may be meeting in their uh, town hall maybe make uh, meeting with their elders in their indigenous nation assembly or whatever, and then I'll just spend a day or two just living with them and um, doing a ethnographic, well, just hanging out uh, and <laughs> making sure that um, whatever they have to say is in the public uh, on the record so that people will talk about public affairs instead of private uh, interests. And then whatever they say is then live stream both ways to Taipei, where the 12 ministries are sitting there and listening to their ideas. And so in Taiwan, we say in Mandarin, 见面三分情, meeting face to face is 30% of trust. Uh, so meeting through high speed uh, video conferences, maybe 20% of trust. And they will learn that previously when they talked to Ministry of Interior, the MOI would say, oh, this is a good idea, but I'll have to copy the Ministry of Health, or I'll have to copy the Ministry of Economy. But turns out each copying is very lossy in its compression. Uh, whatever their full story is, is uh, lost in maybe two A4 papers, maybe five PowerPoint slides. Uh, and then the other municipalities or other ministries thought they solved the problem that actually solved the wrong problem. Uh, but with this arrangement, because all the section chiefs are on the same room, the Minister of Interior here I cannot say I'll have to copy the Ministry of Health because the Ministry of Health is sitting right next to them. And so with the local people watching, they actually have to brainstorm right on the spot and solve the problem right there. And if they solve it, they get a full credit compared to the previous battle days, where if they solve the problem, their minister get a credit. Now they get a credit. And if they really doesn't help and people become angry, well, you can't really hurt people over the screen. So I absorb the risk because I'm the only person <laughs> in that vicinity, and, and so uh, from a safe space afar, uh, they can try to brainstorm all sorts of different ideas and gauge uh, its um, response from the local people and the local elders, in both meaning of that word. Um, and so the, the idea is that if we go to people, instead of asking people to come to technology, I would argue that it actually works even better than the office hour arrangement, because you, you say you're going to copy that, so I have to say that if you just go where people are, it's actually even better uh, results. I hope that answered your question. So there, there was a question over there. Yes. Uh, so you mean the technological application? Well, so uh, truth to be told, most of the time we just use um, spreadsheets. Uh, but, um, yeah, but we also uh, have our own cybersecurity department audited um, technology called Sandstorm. Um, and this is something I think that's still pretty useful, even it's now entirely a open source project and um, we're kind of the team maintaining it now. Uh, but in any case, um, this is useful, if, especially if you're working in public sector, because public sector would like to know that the underlying um, access control, underlying auditing, underlying cybersecurity system is hardened. And we have the Department of Cybersecurity uh, working with white hat hackers that won second place in DEF CON, uh, half a year uh, using an open source audit to, and they filed three CV and finally said that this is very secure. And they secure the entire um, 
um, platform so that you can run any arbitrary open source applications on top of it. Uh, the most popular one being ordering bento, ordering lunchbox together. Um, but in any case, you can very easily using JavaScript, write your, or whatever language, write your own project. And the uh, usual community ones like HackMD, uh, which is an open source fork called CodyMD, is what we use every day uh, just by bringing it into the Sandstorm uh, application uh, market space. Of course, I personally maintained uh, a spreadsheet in it, the EtherCalc, uh, and we use, of course, Weekend, which is a straight copy of Trello, uh, and so on and so forth. And so all the productivity software can be used kind of free of charge uh, and within a really cybersecurity fastened um, um, workspace. So that's the, the main thing that we, we push, but we also, of course, also maintain polis and also maintain uh, all sort of different technologies. I think that the point here is just to use the whatever open source technology that the free software community at the moment is using and incorporating it in a way that is compatible with your cybersecurity agenda. I think that's the basic idea. Yes. Um, so. The, the two things, right? Uh, I showed Polis, which is the, the kind of open-ended wiki survey thing. Um, and it's on GitHub. You can very easily use it. Uh, if you want to use quadratic voting in a closed uh, system setting, like a board meeting, I would actually suggest you just use spreadsheets. But if you <laughs> well, need a highly interactive one, I would suggest you looking into the Colorado uh, system, uh, the Santiago series system, that they made it uh, high open source. And it's on GitHub. And if you can't set it up, you have support here. <laughs> you, check, you can just use Santiago, <laughs> right? Um, and so, because their UI is better than ours. And, and also, you don't have to translate from Mandarin back to English. So, um, I think that's the two advantage. Uh, there was questions over the back, uh, or no? Okay, we're good? All right. So, we have, what, 15 minutes? 15 minutes. So, yes. So, I'll just give maybe... Um, a few seconds to each question. Uh, so um, two people would like to know whether the slides are public. Yes, um, all my slides are public. Uh, it's on issue. I, I'll maybe tweet about it, but just to make sure it's, if you want to download it, you can do so now. It's on pdis.tw, which uh, issue.com, and public digital innovation space, the Taiwan, the TW. And so this is the slide. I made some last minute changes, so I'll update that right after the talk. Uh, and many other um, ideas like <coughs> the gender uh, impact assessment, the digital dialogues and so on are all on the same uh, website. So feel free just to consult uh, the slide. Um, you mentioned identities are government issues. Who generates and controls the private keys for these identities and how are private keys managed? As far as I know, our current generation of EID card is uh, kind of like, or maybe just Java card, uh, that they just generate in a secure enclave, um, tamper-proof-ish, uh, I think, uh, that are generated uh, upon production. And uh, the private key is never copied out uh, to any place, so it relies on the kind of physical uh, support of the, the EID. Uh, the new EID starting next year uh, is also going to be FIDO2 uh, uh, compliant. Uh, and also, um, we're looking into ways uh, to work with uh, security chips in phones such as HTC uh, that can <laughs> securely store private keys uh, that are compatible with our EID system. And it will be API based uh, because um, nowadays in Taiwan, when we buy a new, procure a new government service, if the vendor said that um, I can only serve human beings and not robots, not APIs, uh, we can actually disqualify them for discrimination. Well, for <laughs> for, for non-professionalism. Uh, it's just like uh, 10 years ago, if you um, run into a uh, procurement where your vendor says, I can only serve with people with sightedness, but not people with blindness, uh, you can disqualify them for discriminating or actually for you know unprofessionalism. Uh, so now we're saying robots are people, I guess, uh, where we're using the same procurement clause that says uh, if your um, ministry or agency that contracts out requires a machine-to-machine -machine interface open API uh, using the Linux Foundation standard open API 3, um, and you cannot deliver it, uh, and then you just get disqualified. If you said you require three times the procurement money uh, to deliver a API version, you can also be disqualified. Uh, and so because of that, it, this kind of API-first design uh, is really uh, 
part of the government digital service standard now in Taiwan. So because of that, we get much better uh, integration with third-party uh, scenarios and uh, use cases, and especially you know devices like virtual reality and mixed reality, which is far beyond any procurement agency's uh, ability to to spec. But if we uh, just deliver the open APIs, very creative people from mixed realities just started uh, coming out with very interesting interface to public services after all. And so uh, we're going to apply the same idea to our EID infrastructure starting next year as well. But nowadays, uh, this is based on a physical card. Uh, okay. So, uh, Oreen McMillan uh, would like to know, uh, in my opinion, what is the optimal cost for one vote in quadratic voting and finance? Well, this is kind of by definition uh, the, the quadratic, the, the square <laughs> of the uh, of the vote uh, required. The entire design of QV or QF um, is predicated on the fact that if you analyze what each marginal vote can do in terms of the social value it created or captured, um, you, it makes the uh, marginal return the same as marginal cost. If you price it so that it's not quadratic, uh, like uh, five points buys you five votes, uh, then it's actually too cheap uh, for that, and people would just um, use the strategy to just vote whatever the votes they have on the single one. And But if you price it differently, um, then um, basically the optimal converging point is that if the uh, return is the same as the cost, yes. Right, so I mean, it, it, this is a more practical question. This is not a, a theoretical question because, as a co-op or as a uh, government, you probably already have a allotted of uh, budget to match with. And beyond that, you're just going to proportionally uh, match. And in the worst case uh, analysis, if you have zero dollars to match, then what this is actually going to do is perhaps just looking at the total area and make sure that X only get this number of funding and use this funding <laughs> to, to right? If you don't have anything to match, all you can do is redistribute. Uh, and then you can redistribute with zero matching, uh, making sure that uh, everything is still proportional to the um, square of the sum of the square roots. Uh, and you still get the same shape, of course, now taking um, this very wealthy and, um, I don't know, um, like very social, pro-social uh, vendor uh, and contributor to es essentially subsidize for everybody else. And you can still imagine that arrangement working if people are generally agreeing that they're on the same polity. And a, a good thing for the group is also indirectly good for the single person. Uh, of course, if you don't have that social arrangement, uh, matching is, of course, a better incentive uh, so that this person don't reach quit or something like that. <laughs> but but uh, you can e easily imagine the spectrum between those two polar ends and design accordingly. Yeah. We're good? OK. So um, we have 10 minutes. Um, I don't worry about vote buying at this stage. Uh, I've already explained that. Um, this I already explained. Um, so how do I get different ministries to work toward a common goal? This is a great question. Um, so the, the good thing about um, the RxC vision is that it doesn't really have to be a common goal. Um, it could be just a common value, and it's very different. Uh, each ministry caring about the social, business, governance, environment still care about whatever goals that they care about. We're not asking them to reduce their goals. What we're essentially asking is that they also consider the values of other ministries when they uh, form their goals. And so this is the idea of collaborative governance or COGOF. It's essentially uh, just by getting people into the habit of working out aloud. Most of the time, they just automatically have a copy of other ministries people in their mind. Uh, they develop a theory of mind of other ministries so that when they go about forming their goals, they will also check whether it works with the common values of the other ministries people we, which they shared, uh, you know, this kind of meetings and this kind of uh, very good creative um, space and also excellent food. Food is also very important every time uh, that they participate into those regional evaluation tours. We make sure that there is a resident chef and, and that it opens until 11 p.m. so that people can enjoy food after the meetings and so on. And so if people share over food um, their values, um, most of the time they would just start forming uh, a common values it's kind of automatically because they will have a copy of their other people's values in their mind. And when they're making decisions, they will kind of automatically consider those um, different values instead of just their own positions. But this is through osmosis. Uh, no amount of mechanism design can uh, 
uh, force that happen, but you can incentivize that uh, to happen. So wild molasses, <laughs> I would like to know. Government plays an essential role in coordinating humanity, but in some places, in most places, it's inefficient and harmful. Uh, well, mostly inefficient, uh, mostly harmless, but sometimes harmful. Uh, <laughs> and uh, <coughs> are you optimistic about decentralized coordination? Yes, I am really optimistic about <laughs> decentralized coordination because it's cheaper than centralized coordination. Uh, before, the, the great thing that is the internet and end-to-end -end principle and permissionless innovation, we can't really say the same because at that time, hierarchical communication is cheaper. Uh, but now, um, it's actually more expensive to limit your message's audience. You have to think about it. And But if you make your message public, you don't have to think about it. And, and so basically, uh, the internet reconfigured um, the movements so that the mostly the, the thing you have to think about uh, is a domain name, maybe, uh, in DNS or ENS. Uh, maybe you have to think about the right hashtag. But beyond that, <laughs> it is in the hands of the crowd. It is in the hands of collective intelligence. You don't really have to be kind of the, the choking point of the coordination. And that really is the idea of decentralization. And that's not because we kind of believe it in it ideologically, because we're lazy and this is more efficient. Uh, and so <laughs> I think that's the main main uh, motivation. It is somewhat determined uh, by the um, idea of open internet, which is why critical core in internet infrastructure is so important to protect. But um, I think the government uh, nowadays, at least in Taiwan, are also learning that it's better if instead of just sending a message to everybody and getting everybody classified as spam, uh, it's maybe better just to uh, make memes uh, of our policies and make memes of our clarifications, and then people will just you know organically spread out and remix it and things like that. And so, just you know, um, we we actually poach people from NICAG and so on to make sure that uh, we package our communication material in a way that that is are organically viral and, and making sure that people can use the horizontal, um, actionable, extensible, and um, collaborative way of uh, just uh, making the social innovations and that fields belonging to the social sector, like the air boxes, instead of having the government play always in an arbitrating or uh, role that uh, blocks innovation. So that's the, the basic idea. Do you have working regulations in place to regulate industries such as exchanges and the ICO? Yes, we do. And uh, we have this idea, um, which I can't really explain in detail for f four minutes' time, but the basic idea is of a sandbox. Um, the sandbox is a really simple idea, that, uh, and it started, I think, from the UK, uh, the Singapore also rolled it out for FinTech, but in Taiwan, sandbox is general purpose, as in general purpose computing. <laughs> if you go to sandbox or GTW, you see sandbox applications around every ministry, really, uh, at least a dozen ministries. And so there may be a sandbox about, I don't know, e-scooter rental, uh, maybe a sandbox about um, you know uh, using your mobile phone as your uh, banking card, uh, maybe about self-driving tricycles, and not even tricycles, because our self-driving <coughs> sandbox doesn't really care about a vehicle, so it could be a car that flies or a ship that uh, goes to the land or whatever. Uh, but in any case, they uh, once you have an innovation uh, and a place that want to uh, work with you, and we coach that place to serve as a one-year sandbox. And so it could be a fintech, a cryptocurrency, a whatever arrangement. Uh, but if uh, at the end of the one year, people accept it's a good idea, then your forked version of regulation become our regulation. Um, and the ministers uh, actually don't have to rule on things that we don't have the first-hand experience of. So everybody get one year of first-hand experience. Of course, the MP at any time can say, oh, we want a special law about it. But they can take three years or four years for self-driving vehicles to make a, a special law about that particular innovation. But during that lawmaking process, uh, your s experiment is still legal. So it becomes kind of a limit time mon monopoly because everybody else is still illegal. And you can still operate your business within that three year or four years time frame. But at the time where it has a new law uh, done pertaining to your business, of course, competitor will enter the market. So what Taiwan is essentially offering is a safe space for you to experiment your ideas. And if the ideas doesn't work, well, thank you for paying the tuition for everybody, I guess. But if, if it does work, then your version of regulation just becomes our national regulation. So um, FinTech Sandbox, I think it's not a uh, new idea, certainly not unique to Taiwan, but we're applying it to all sorts of different regulations and municipality rules.
what what kind of public decision do I think is suit for QV and what is not? So this is for you to find out. <laughs> but uh, what what I think is um, what's obviously is is that like participatory budgeting, it's a, a agenda setting power that's set aside that adds something, an element of innovation, and doesn't take anything away. And in this kind of uh, agenda setting, people are much more tolerant, even if it's a total disaster, even if uh, nobody turned out voting, but we would say that we learned something. But if this is about electing your mayors, electing your president, uh, that may not be a good idea. So basically, <laughs> uh, choose uh, things that vote for things, not people, but also making sure that the things are extra things instead of taking away things. You had a question? Well, we're already using ledgers uh, in, in uh, decisions. Uh, as I mentioned about airbox and later on water box and so on, we're using ledgers so that people who don't quite believe in each other can still contribute to the commons, to the data commons. And so for that particular application, ledgers are, are great. It's not like we have other technologies that can solve the same problem. Uh, but for many other scenarios, we, we're not automatically using ledgers. Uh, sometimes all you need is a database. So I, I think this is just a a tool in the toolkit is a very powerful tool, but it's used only when you have a multi-party, non-mutually uh, trusting relationship that nevertheless want to work on common data. And, and so nowadays there's a pretty good flow chart in the Taiwan public sector of when to use ledgers and when not to use ledgers. Yeah, I mean, if transaction rate can be faster, there's more applications, but that's what DEF CON is for, right? <laughs> and, 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 but uh, for, for air quality measurement and so on, uh, I think this is uh, the current generation of technology is useful enough because they're using zero G network anyway, MBIOT and so on. And MBIOT has very limited bandwidth anyway, so <laughs> it's not like it will saturate the, the writing uh, to the ledger. Uh, so I, I think so far, using uh, only atmospheric or environmental data, uh, we're uh, matching what the current capacity of the ledger technology in play. But of course, if there's better and faster transaction rate, of course, we can do more. Yeah. And we're at time. So um, as I mentioned, sorry about the other 14 um, people who proposed questions but didn't uh, get sufficient number of votes. Maybe people should buy votes beforehand. But <laughs> <laughs> but if you're um, interested in the in the rest of the ideas, um, after data, data dignity, there's the idea of common ownership, of identity and community, and so on. Please feel free to just uh, follow uh, the Reddit Exchange Twitter account, as well as uh, just my Twitter account. It's Audrey T, A-U-D-R-E-Y-T on Twitter. And feel free just to email or tweet or whatever. And thank you for this two-hour session. Thank you.